Hello and welcome to the first episode of Principles of Clio Metrics. This video series is designed to give interested students of economic and social history, and I put economic and social in parentheses, an introduction to the fundamental concepts of quantitative techniques. My name is Joshua Rutzig and I'm currently a master student of constitutional, social and economic history at the History Department of the University of Bonn, Germany. So why am I doing videos on Clio Metrics? Over a year ago, I started to be interested in quantitative methods. The only problem was that there is no clear metrics in the curriculum of continental European historians. So what did I do? I explored the internet for resources and decided to be an autodidact. Let me tell you, I never imagined the internet of being capable of producing world-class education for free. There's tons of world-class lectures on topics such as statistics and econometrics. I would have never achieved what I do today if it was not for great people like Brendan Folds or the guys from OpenIntro.org. So what I want to do here is give this knowledge back to my fellow historians. This course is designed for people relatively new to statistics that want to understand these techniques in order to use it for their academic work. So you don't have to be a historian. All of, all of the content can be used in other fields of study. As I said, this course is designed for historians that don't have any quantitative methods in their curriculum. So there's no need for any prior knowledge. We'll start right at the beginning. So let's get into it. What is Clio metrics? Clio metrics. Well, first, there's the word Clio. That is the muse of historical sciences. And then there's the word metrics that is the art of measuring combine both and you get Clio metrics why should a historian bother using these techniques isn't history about telling stories well no history is about explaining the past in order to explain the past we can use the same tools as our neighboring disciplines like the social sciences and economics do what we want to explain is human action the only difference is that we want to explain certain action of certain people while our neighbors in the social sciences and economics want to do it on a general level. Now you could say, isn't this extremely difficult? The last time I was using equations was in high school. I'm going to be honest with you, although I was enrolled in an advanced mathematics class in high school, I never was really good at it. So the first time I got in contact with quantitative methods, I was overwhelmed with the complexity. I thought I will fail at this. But very soon I realized that quantitative methods are not about solving equations, which can be extremely painful. It is about understanding the concepts and the philosophy behind these techniques. And once you understood these concepts, the equations are extremely easy to read. We won't be doing any calculations. The idea that a student should be able to calculate statistical tests or regression equations is, I think, is due to the age of most statistics teachers. We live in a highly computerized environment, so we can let the computer do the calculation for us. So doing calculations is not what we will learn in this course. Another set of skills will become much more valuable to us. That is programming. In order to do the calculations, I will use, and I heavily urge you to do this as well, the free statistical program R. R might be the most sophistical, uh, sophisticated statistical software out there. But there are other tools like Stator. If you're in economics, you might know Stator. Or if you're in the social sciences, you might know SPSS. When I started to learn quantitative methods, I've learned it with SPSS. As soon as I was doing my first quantitative paper, the shortcomings of SPSS came right at me. SPSS is lacking a huge amount of statistical tests. R can do everything you want, so we'll use R. Don't worry, I'll give you an intro to that as well. So, now we know what software to use, but what about the books? There are two books that were extremely helpful to me. The first one is Open Intro Statistics by the people of openintro.org. And the second is Making History Count, a prime and quantitative methods for historians. I will use both of, both of these books to explain the basic concepts. Open Intro Statistics is a free online textbook. Um, Making History Count is a classical full price textbook that is totally worth its price. To understand the concept of R, I would suggest you get a copy of the R cookbook. 
The R cookbook is a problem-oriented intro to R and is extremely user-friendly. I'll put the links into the description. So what can Clio Metrics do and what can it not do? With Clio Metrics, you can answer questions of all sorts. You could quantify differences. For example, was there a vocational difference between representatives in the German National Assembly of 1848 in the light of their party affiliation? You can quantify relations. For example, did falling transportation costs lead to lower wheat prices in 19th century Great Britain? If yes, by how much? You can standardize macroeconomic indicators. For example, how can I compare internal price differences between two countries? You can do much more than this, but questions of this nature are most likely to interest you. What are the limitations of Clio metrics? The first time you get to know all these techniques, you feel able to explain everything. Every, everywhere you'll see measurable cause and effect. The truth is, is, though, that very often we are limited in how we can use our toolkit, and it is especially true for history. First of all, these techniques come with a massive load of restrictions. Don't worry, we would, don't worry we'll talk about them as well. Secondly, there's the well-known saying, correlation does not imply causation, which is also true. Just because you found a measurable cause and effect doesn't mean that it is really there. A good model does not substitute good historical reasoning. It can only be an auxiliary science, like linguistic, for example. And maybe the biggest problem, social scientists won't uh, have that problem, for most of the questions there is no sufficient data. For example, most economic data of the 19th century is heavily aggregated and measured only in, on a yearly basis. Besides these restrictions, statistical reasoning might be the most valuable asset in the toolkit of a historian. So I would encourage you to stay with me and learn quantitative methods.